Um, I'd like to, my name's Gordon Platt. I'm the president of uh, Gotham Media, a uh, conference and uh, strategic communications company. Uh, we're holding this event for um, Karma. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you and our panelists for coming today, and especially Karma for sponsoring the event. Um, Karma has been an innovator in analyzing media of all types for over 30 years. And uh, initially it was news media, now it's media of all types. And they're now active in uh, 110 countries uh, across the world. So they really do have a tremendous uh, international footprint. And uh, to, we're going to have a two-stage uh, event today. First is uh, we're going to have a short uh, presentation, and then we're going to get transition right into the panel discussion. So at the uh, outset, I'd like to introduce Tom Vizi from Karma, who is going to uh, give a sort of 10,000-foot view of the, our topic for today, which is sustaining reputational capital and, and crisis management. Tom has been in the communications field for over 35 years, uh, and in that time he's uh, served in a variety of different roles and uh, had a variety of different experiences uh, at, at various companies. Um, as far as Karma is concerned, he set up, that, uh, he set up Karma International in 2000, uh, and it has been uh, uh, leading international news and analysis business in Europe with a wide range of clients from uh, Shell and Nike to McDonald's. And he is now the managing director of Karma for North America and Europe. So really, without further ado, I'd like to turn over the proceedings to Tom and uh, get things started. Thank you very much, Gordon. And uh, once again, thanks to everyone for coming and for our panelists who are going to enlighten us afterwards. A bit closer. Is that better? OK, thanks a lot. Um, getting straight into it, this is a, an extraordinary industry, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, if you look back and the benefits uh, the industry has brought to society um, over the last century and a bit, it's uh, extraordinary. And I think it's easy for many people to forget that a lot of us would be dead from um, very banal diseases if we didn't have this industry. Um, but I think what we also have to recognize is that it is an industry uh, in recent years that has been regularly in conflict uh, with the core values which underpin what the industry is, is best known for, which is care, well-being, uh, helping uh, vulnerable people and what have you. Um, obviously, there's a wide range of issues from here from covering bribery to faking data, uh, moving on to uh, you know the complexities of um, the Chinese uh, industry and all the uh, underhand methodologies that are sometimes deployed in that market, to the way regulations are interpreted um, and uh, aggressive marketing um, and others. Um, and this, of course, okay, yeah. So this is uh, obviously a, a huge challenge. Um, I think it's worth pausing, saying this isn't just about, this isn't PR, you know. Um, reputation is value. And when an organization loses reputation, value is lost um, extremely fast. Uh, this is uh, the value of a, uh, the stock price of a major um, pharmaceutical company, uh, which I won't bother to identify, but uh, in the um, couple of years following a crisis, and you could see the the the, uh, the 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 impact, and it's the same in every industry. Uh, you know, we work for many years at McDonald's. Uh, you know, after the um, crisis erupted on uh, marketing to children, they lost 50% of their value in six months. So, you know, it, it, reputation and value are intimately linked, and and shouldn't be just seen as. Um, as PR. So, as I said on the first slide, this is really uh, a, an industry of key importance to the whole of society. So, you know, we can't let it drift on an uncertain reputational sea. So, uh, what I want to do now is look at a few slides based on research we've done. Um, the first is some news analysis um, that covers um, a number of markets, the major markets globally, um, north, you know, from the Americas, Europe. Uh, to Asia, 
The, the media here, there was about 15 media in each market, and they covered, obviously, things like the Wall Street Journal, Le Monde, The Economist, but also um, professional media, and also um, what I'd call city-based media, where there's a major pharmaceutical company based, and it's over a three-year period. Just before I look at this one, this line shows our core scoring mechanism, which was developed by the University of Massachusetts, which is called the IQ. And it includes the volume of coverage, so the number of articles appearing, the audience reach of those articles. So if you get a stinker in the Wall Street Journal, that's going to do you a lot more damage, or you, need, you get a great one than it is in um, a small title, but also the sentiment. So it is an integrated measure of um, impact of the news media. And what you can see is that the, the news media has been extraordinarily more and more supportive of the industry since 2013. You can see there in the Q1 2016 a drop. This wasn't based on criticism. It was based on a fall off in um, what we can see on the next slide is a fall off in uh, M&A activity. Um, these again, this uses the IQ score on the left hand axis. And this is the number of articles on the bottom axis. Uh, and you can see here, um, these are the major themes in, in the news. Finance uh, acquisitions completely dominated and fueled the rise of, um, of uh, the uh, positive reputational profiling uh, in the industry. And that is now tailing off. What you can also see here, that it has hidden some very major challenges. So these are high volume, very high volume, and very negative themes, regulation, management. <clears throat> um, if we then look at some of these positive themes and try and uh, get under the skin of it a bit, um, you could, this again is the IQ score. The, the green bit at the top is the total positive IQ. The red bit at the bottom is the total negative IQ. And the blue dot in the middle is the average score. So although, as you can see, finance had a very high, high positive score, uh, as did product services technologies, um, and corporate, uh, which is the M&A and what have you, um, they also had a very deep trail of, of negative coverage as well. Um, you know, we see finance, the cost to Sanofi uh, of corruption, in terms of products, JNG ordered to pay half a billion for, uh, for flaws in artificial hips, again on products, Novartis faces suspension in Japan after led data issues on a product trial. Um, and in the corporate sphere, sometimes an arrogance creeping in, just refusing to acknowledge, uh, engage, which, um, which obviously is uh, highly risky. So those are the three key positive areas. But even in these positive areas, there's a major undercurrent of negativity. And obviously, if we look at things like management, um, we, we, Witty prospers despite China corruption scandal, and, um, and regulation, which are the, the two major negative themes, uh, they're uh, there as well. What I'd now like to look, to look at is, in this coverage, we looked at what you could call the major um, perceptions of benefit to, of the industry to society, and I hope that is legible. They read from left to right, health benefits, science, the better life you get from pharmaceutical, access to medicine, consumer benefits, and the side effects. And you can see again here, even with the highest scoring one, which is health benefits, a very major drag of negative coverage there. Um, you know, the BMJ here uh, talking about people being routine prescribed antipsychotic drugs and they don't need them. Um, access to medicine, again, it's a major challenge uh, in the industry. And uh, again, JNJ marketed Risperdal aggressively to elderly and boys um, whilst allegedly manipulating and hiding the data. So that's in perceptions in articles where a major pharmaceutical company is featured. So there's going to be ability to talk. If you then look at the same data uh, in articles where no pharmaceutical company is mentioned, so where the media are writing about the industry without having talked to or indeed describing a particular company, you can see that none of these major benefits of the industry um, has any positive impact at all in the echo in the media. So when the media are writing about this globally without involving pharmaceutical companies, the uh, benefits evaporate completely and there is a negative profiling with by far the largest being the um, side effect, uh, negative side effects of medicine. If we then turn to see who is speaking about the industry in, in these um, 
40,000 odd articles. Um, you can see here, again, this is the IQ score, the positive, the negative, and the average. The only two sources of external commentator providing supportive comment on the industry are either financial analysts here or uh, sector analysts here. Regulators, government politicians, academics, NGOs, doctors, associations, and patients are the others. Uh, so it's only the analyst community that's um, supporting it. Now, again, these are in articles in which a major pharma company is mentioned. If you then look at those articles where the media are talking about the industry without the presence of a major pharma, every one becomes negative. All of the commentators on the industry are commenting negatively on it when pharmaceutical companies are not available to defend themselves. If we move then on to positive themes that um, could be enhanced, enhancing the industry, you've got here on the right-hand side for reference the volume of articles on finance. It's not terribly clear, but it's 11,000 or 10,000. The, these themes that could really help the industry um, profile itself better, get better reputational support, disaster relief support, work with communities, sustainability, educational support, um, are, are really getting, uh, if you look here, you can, you can barely see the, um, the, the blocks, except corporate thought leadership, where there is uh, extremely positive thought. This is the only theme amongst these softer themes to be developed. Um, if we then move on to stakeholder analysis, and this is a really substantial piece of work we did last year with about uh, 11,000 um, people in the States covering uh, a wide range of stakeholders, as you can see there. You see what, you know, and we've worked across all the major industries. Um, I have never seen such a lack of differentiation in an industry. This is a reputational resilience index where five, as you can see, is built of rock. Uh, like uh, Apple, and one is when the company can really barely function anymore because its reputation is so bad. So, for example, Pakistani Airlines. In the middle here, you've got a reputation is exposed. And I, I have never seen an industry where all of the players, the major players, have virtually no differentiation at all um, in their reputations. Uh, so very exposed. So if one tries to draw some conclusions of that, this hyping of the industry in the media has been um, based on surfing on a risky wave of M&A and strong results, which is now turning. Several of the underlying key themes that will no doubt not go away, management and regulation, are very challenging for the industry and uh, negative. The reputational enhancing themes uh, are by and large, with the exception of corporate thought leadership, completely undeveloped. And so when you get the financial wave turning, that only leaves um, negative themes there. We've seen the severe and growing criticism of the cost of medicine, and the criticism of the side effects of medicine has been rising sharply. And the, the uh, most influential commentators on the industry, particularly in those articles that don't mention a uh, pharmaceutical company, are unsupportive uh, and decritical. And indeed, stakeholders in the US have a low level of enthusiasm and see no differentiation. So our read on that is, this clearly offers a major opportunity for firms to improve their resilience through differentiating themselves through reputation. And let's be clear, reputation is about behavior. It's about the way an organization behaves. So there's a major opportunity there. But what is also absolutely clear is there is a huge risk here. Because when there is no differentiation, when it's driven by finance and, and M&A and that starts to subside, um, there is nothing left uh, really to, to build on. And so. Um, with that um, somewhat challenging thought, I'll um, <laughs> pass it over to the panel. Um, so uh, I'll now pass it over to uh, Eric Dazenhall. Eric is no stranger to the world of reputation and crisis management. As the founder and CEO of Dazenhall Communications, he's worked with numerous clients over the course of the last 30 years to help resolve crises of all types. His clients include some of the world's largest names and best-known pharmaceutical and healthcare companies. I'm reliably informed that he cut his teeth in crisis management many years ago in the Reagan, in the Reagan, I beg your pardon, White House, so he knows a few things about crisis management. He's a graduate of Dartmouth College, and without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to the panel and to Eric. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? 
Okay, the way, the way I want to work this is uh, I'm going to ask my panelists uh, some questions. Um, and what I would ask so we don't get into having to go over bios is each panelist will just once st state their name and affiliation. And you could look in your uh, materials about uh, more, more, more background. I, I, so I'd like to begin uh, with an act of heresy. Um, and ask the question, keying off of what Tom said, does reputation actually matter as much as we think, and how does it matter? And what I would like to ask my fellow panelists to talk about is specifically to drill down on their discipline, how and why reputation matters. Because one of the biases that I come at this with is there are plenty of industries and companies that have awful reputations and do perfectly well for a long time. I mean, nobody likes Goldman Sachs, but they, can, they keep doing better and better. So with that sort of purposely cynical um, beginning, I'd like to go down and have each of my panelists address the issue of how and why does or doesn't reputation matter. Steal that from you. Sure. Thanks, Eric. I'm Peter Pitts. I'm a former FDA associate commissioner. I can show you my scars after. And I run a small um, think tank called the Center for Medicine and the Public Interest. Why does it matter? During one of the early Democrat debates, Hillary Clinton says that the two people that should fear her the most were Iran and the pharmaceutical industry. What's wrong with this picture? Uh, Donald Trump said he was such a, such a great negotiator. He was actually going to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies for uh, Medicare and Medicaid expenses and save more money than we actually spend on Medicare and Medicaid. So the problem isn't that there are problems with products. All products have issues. No product is entirely safe. The problem is that there's no ability to get beyond the rhetoric of pharmaceutical companies are bad and greedy and talk about the issue of value rather than price. It's a terrific argument. You know, we spend in this country 10% of our healthcare resources, give or take, on pharmaceuticals. Most people think it's in the high 80% uh, range. The message isn't getting through. Uh, pharma and bio trade associations are beginning, uh, both beginning uh, campaigns on the value of medicine. Uh, it, it's not new. It's the right message. I don't know whether it's going to resonate in the political campaign, I guess from a crisis perspective, an ongoing crisis perspective, how do you create a environment uh, where an audience, and again, you have to define your audiences too, I think these campaigns are initially aimed at inside the Beltway audiences, how do you create an environment when people, where people are cognitively able to listen to your message and give it, and give it a think? Because you know, as you pointed out earlier, people aren't thinking about Pfizer or Bristol-Myers Squibb or any company by name, they're thinking about products. And like with Congress, Congress is corrupt, my congressman is great. You know, drugs are dangerous oh, and too expensive, my, my, my drug is specific. People don't understand the technical aspects of bioequivalents and biosimilars versus generics and what does regulation really mean and why are our drugs approved other places sooner than they are here and you know, is, is healthcare free anywhere in the world and why can't it be free here? Uh, and you know, politicians don't help. Bernie Sanders wants free healthcare but Bernie, Sanders, but Bernie Sanders supporters don't want taxes raised to pay for health care. You know, hello. You know, um, you know, it's, you know the, the rhetoric does not help this industry. And, you know, a, a soft-spoken, mild-mannered, targeted campaign on how hard pharmaceutical scientists work, you know, you know is nice as at a video at an alumni conference. You know, I, I doubt it's, it's real intrinsic value, at least over the long term, in changing public perceptions. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, hi. My name is Yuri Strobos, and uh, I was an official in the commissioner's office as well, and now I'm an attorney uh, with the firm of Olson, Frank, and Weedon. Um, does reputation matter? So um, my client's uh, customers, uh, from my standpoint, is uh, frequently the Food and Drug Administration. And um, I... There are people in the Food and Drug Administration who have general attitudes and uh, thoughts about particular companies and whether they do things right or not. Um, most of those people are not in the review teams. Um, and frankly, there's been so many mergers and combinations that I think even uh, the people at FDA who are involved with company-specific issues 
don't even know uh, which company they're particularly dealing with anymore. Um, I think that reputation matters a lot in the particular process. So it's a lengthy process with the FDA, um, whether it's in an enforcement issue or whether it's a pre-market issue. And you certainly establish the people in the company and the company certainly establish a reputation with the people they are dealing with um, during that process. And you can feed on that later if, if we're talking the same individuals, not the same company necessarily. Um, so a team of people that has worked successfully with FDA, if they have to work again with FDA, I think they start with a slightly you know, higher credibility. Um, I personally think when you're dealing with the public, um, it, you know, we, we uh, I think the marketing industry talks about messaging. In, um, in my world, it's, it's language. It's the specific words that you use. Um, I, for instance, am allergic to the word problem. And I always substitute with, you know, concern or issue. Um, and that works with FDA as well. So I think you enhance your reputation with FDA by interacting, by presenting good science, by showing that you're reliable, by showing that you're sort of firm, but, um, you know, that eventually you will back up um, what you're saying. Um, so I do think reputation matters, but it's more the team that matters and it's more during the process of engagement um, rather than the company itself. Thank you. Um, hi, if you looked at the program, you can probably guess that I'm Peggy Peck, because I'm, <laughs> okay, we can always look at the chromosomal profile here and figure out who I am. Um, I'm the editor-in-chief at MedPage today, um, and, and, um, and I, I think reputation does matter. But, and I can tell you that, I mean, I'm a journalist, I'm a longtime journalist, and so how do journalists look at, at pharmaceutical companies? Well, amongst ourselves, um, and by the way, when I say, when we say the industry, so it would be the pharmaceutical companies and the device industry, which we tend to lump together, okay? They're the people who make profits, make money by making products that are used by, in, in, the case, in my case, for my page today, our readers are healthcare um, professionals. So I write to the people that write the script, that, that, that decide the treatments, that manage the patients, that's my audience, 730,000 US physicians. That's my daily audience, seven days a week. That's what I'm hammering. So, um, so I, amongst, uh, you know, in our own little circles, we often refer to people who work directly for the pharmaceutical industry, um, writers and stuff who take on projects directly for the pharmaceutical industry. We say they do dark side work. Does that give you a hint of where we're coming from? Okay, so do I admit to bias? Yes. Yes, I mean, I would lie if I said the journalists don't have a bias. We do have a, have a bias. And so I have to fight every day to overcome that bias. Um, and, and what feeds the bias? What feeds the bias is, um, is a long time um, interaction with some, not all, some pharmaceutical companies who, are, who have a complete aversion to transparency. A complete aversion to transparency. And that when they, when, when they, when they are confronted with data that are unfavorable, they will, they will deny, they will obfuscate in some way. And, and when that happens, believe me, if somebody says to me, no comment, you gotta know I'm going for them. And I have a, I have a, an exper I can give you a good example of this. Um, in February, I was out in uh, California and I was covering a stroke meeting. Um, and I was sitting in a, in a session and there was just, a, there was just an offhand remark made about um, a, about TPA um, and and it, it talked about the cost of uh, that this huge escalation 146 percent escalation in price to the hospitals and that and that particular drug is paid for in Part A Medicare so I was looking at Medicare numbers okay it's because it's administered in the hospital and that's how it's paid and so this was this this cost increase was so great that hospitals that had stroke centers really didn't have any margin for the neurologists and the radiologists and the nurses and all these other people because most of the bucks were going for this. But they were, so, so, they, so the person who was doing the presentation was really critical of Genentech for this, this price increase. 
And, um, and then they mentioned that there's another Genentech product that is also in the same sort of family, but it's not used. Um, it's not used for stroke. It's used, it's used in the heart. Um, and so, so why they, if, if that were permitted to be used, it would be a lot cheaper. The treatment would be a lot cheaper. So I, um, so I decided this is kind of an interesting story. I'm going to write it up. And I um, contacted Genentech corporate PR, and I said, you know, um, look, I'm doing this story. I'm going to publish this story in, in 45 minutes. And I'm giving you the opportunity. Tell me why your price increased. You tell me why your price increased. You give me an explanation. It's going to be in the story. You don't. I'm going to say, I reached out to you. You didn't respond. I'll add it later. But this is the deal. You know, you have to come back to me. And to their credit, in 20 minutes, I had one response. In, 20, in 30 minutes, I had two responses. And five minutes after we published the story, I had more responses. And every one of those went into the story. And we ended up with what I consider to be a nicely balanced story. And that's really, that's, you know, th that's a white knight in the pharmaceutical industry. A and I could count on one hand how many companies respond that quickly. But every company that responds that quickly to every journalist is remembered and shared among journalists. So you want to have a tool in your toolbox to, for reputation? That's a great tool. Transparency is the absolute best tool in, in, you know, in reputation, rehabilitation, or restoration, or protection. So thank you. Alan? Good morning. I am in the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> I'm supposed to be a quiver. Uh, so I am executive vice president at Azai Inc. Azai is a Japanese-based pharmaceutical company, uh, research and development, manufacturing, and uh, commercialization. We're in both the oncology area as well as the neuroscience area. I joined the company as our general counsel, so I am not just in the industry, I'm a lawyer in the industry. Uh, and, on top, <laughs> and, and, and currently, I'm the head of our market access area, which deals with pricing, contracting, the payers, reimbursement, et cetera. <clears throat> Reputation does matter. I, I think Peggy um, put a very fine point on that. And, I do think it's unfortunate that we have created, all of us, the kind of bias that Peggy uh, embraces or, or, or uh, admits to. You know, in our company, when we get a call from a journalist, and it's not an emergency matter, and they say, you have 45 minutes to respond, you might imagine how we think that story is going to come out regardless of what we say. So. I understand transparency is an issue for us in the industry, and there is more of a demand for transparency. The question is, are we really gonna be able to have the kind of reasoned discussion? These are not simple issues. So very often, if we can have a reasoned discussion, we should be engaging in that. I do wanna to say Tom's presentation about the reputation in our industry is painful to us in industry. I say that because in my experience, and I represented the industry in the beginning of my career as a trial lawyer, I tried cases defending the industry down in the deep south. Reputation matters and I'll get back to that. I've been a counselor to industry and head of a life sciences practice at another firm. I was the general counsel at Pfizer and now I'm in my current job at Azon. And throughout that time, I will tell you, I find the people who are drawn to this industry as opposed to other industries are drawn there because, yes, they want to do well, but they also want to do good. Are there exceptions to that? You bet. Are there bad apples in our industry? You bet. Have we sometimes made terrible mistakes? You bet. We need to do better. Reputation does matter. It matters, as Peter was talking about, politically. The government is our biggest customer. The government is usually powerful in what they can do to our industry. This may be too much inside baseball, but a recent proposal from the government on reimbursement for Part B drugs to oncology clinics could have a huge unintended impact on the treatment of oncology in this country. 
Reputation does matter when dealing with the government and their ability to pass laws. With regulators that Jur was talking about, reputation, your credibility, as Jur was referencing, with the FDA, with other government agencies, CMS, OIG, hugely matters. And as I was referencing before, in the legal world, when you appear in front of that jury, guess where you're starting? When they do surveys of potential jurors, before the case even begins, the pharmaceutical company is highly distrusted, especially in areas like the Deep South. What do we do, and I think it's, it's educational to appreciate what we have to do in that kind of an environment. There we have a captive audience. They're gonna sit with us for two weeks, three weeks. It's a difficult situation. I did product liability work. You're often dealing with somebody who is severely injured. Question, did the company do anything wrong, as in negligent, and or was it the drug that caused the problem? Put those technical issues aside. You're starting with that kind of a situation, a difficult situation. We have to, in that kind of situation, engage in a discussion. Engage in a reasoned discussion. Engage in an educational discussion. So I do think reputation matters tremendously across all these parameters. And often, as a lawyer counseling the company, it's less the legal issue that can knock you down and more the reputational issue. And I would just say you can win the legal case. I don't know how many of you remember this. Dow Corning was in the breast implant litigation. It turns out there was a whole theory about leakage from breast implants, and this is more a device issue, but I think it's still educational, was causing autoimmune disease. As the science evolved over time, it turned out there was no real proof of that. Dow Corning was put out of business. Now, it's not about feeling sympathy for Dow Corning, a big company. There's a lot of people who work at that company. There's a lot of investment that goes into a company like that. So it is about often more the reputation than the legal issues. Thank you. Um, Peter, you had one comment, and then I wanted to make a comment, and then get to a, a, a next question. Sure. Thanks, Eric. I wanted to pick up on something Peggy said, and, and um, Alan discussed it as well. You know, there's an old saying that says everything that you read in the newspaper is true, except for those things you know about personally. You know, when the Martin Jacarelli thing, the Turing Pharmaceuticals issue, hit uh, the, the paper, uh, people said, "See, this is just this is a, a, this is just a." Uh, a steroid injected example of what's wrong with the pharmaceutical industry when in fact it has absolutely nothing to do with that. But you know, we can't let facts get in the way. And you know, Peggy, Peggy is different. Now, Peggy writes technically, she understands the issues, she, she speaks to an audience that understands the issues. Uh, so the, the Turing pharmaceutical things was completely misunderstood and used for purposes other than what it actually was. Uh, the hepatitis C story, I think, is more telling in the sense that initially it was, oh my God, $1,000 a day pill, bankrupt Medicaid, yada, yada, yada. And then, oops, never mind, actually it's going to save us billions of dollars and it's fabulous. But that secondary part never really got the same play um, that, it, that the, the negative parts did. And I think the, the issue that we're dealing with right now uh, that has taken the place of uh, Martin Chakrelli and, and hepatitis C is the, you know, the issue of opioids. Uh, you know, oh, oh my God, you know, what's happening here? Look at Prince. Um, when, the, when the truth of the matter is that there are about a quarter of a billion non-abuse turn opioid tablets dispensed in this country annually, uh, overwhelmingly used appropriately by the you know, hundreds of millions of people in this country who have, who have chronic pain. The, the abusers generally do not get their prescriptions legally, a fact that is rarely mentioned or is used in combination with other drugs, alcohol and marijuana kind of being up there on the top. You know, it's, it's very, I think from a crisis communications perspective, when you're stuck having to explain once you've been smeared, it's, it's tough to come out on top. I think Alan's point about Dow Corning is very good. You know, it's nice to be proven 
you prove right about platinum leakage, uh, not so nice to do it when you're out of a job. Uh, <clears throat> let, me, let me tell you what my admonition would be to you. It would be that <clears throat> as you address the issue of reputation, you insist on drilling down into precisely what it means and where it means something, as opposed to permitting the word reputation in the warm and fuzzy sense to overtake you. Um, my experience is that it matters, reputation matters in front of a jury, it matters politically, it matters recruiting employees, it matters with shareholders. There is a concept that the PR industry promulgates that I think is thoroughly untrue, which is this concept of a trust bank. If you build up trust and your reputation, you can borrow against it in types of cri times of crisis. I see no evidence of that whatsoever. In fact, I see evidence that, that when you find yourself under attack, sometimes the more pristine your company is, the more there is an enjoyment in attacking you. Uh, I think that part of what her has, one of the reasons J&J, uh, &J, uh, they, they've had 50 or so recalls in the last few years, and one of the reasons I think that a lot of the journalists I know enjoy savaging them is the company went on you know, a 25 year road show merchandising the Tylenol case study of 1982, which I regard as a myth. Um, if you want to read more about why I think the Tylenol case study is a myth, you can find it in my books. But I think that, uh, that this whole concept of the trust bank um, is largely mythology. I mean, even though it's not a pharma case study, when the Toyota, when Toyota had their uh, issue of sudden acceleration a few years ago, the media asked what they always asked when a company comes under siege. Can Toyota survive? Most companies under attack do survive. They just don't survive within the news cycle. And a year after Toyota's crisis, sales were up 73%. What does this have to do with reputation? I believe that Toyota recovered because Toyota owners like Toyotas. That is very different than some vague, fuzzy notion of a trust bank or reputation. So that's what I mean by drilling down to what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about reputation. In the case of, of Toyota, it had nothing to do with you know, taking inner city children to ball games. It had everything to do with the fact that Toyota owners like their Toyotas and they have an investment they have an investment in the company's recovery. Which a lot of times what my clients under siege don't have is anybody who has an investment in their recovery. They own you know when BP and oil well spills, the general public has an investment in seeing them go down. They don't want to save them. Which brings me to my next line of questioning which cues off of something that Peggy said. You know, companies under attack and industries under attack find themselves in a situation that the rest of the public doesn't understand. They often, I have yet to meet a pharma general counsel who will allow me to say their product is safe. Um, it is usually heavily edited, so you, I'm, I, I, I want to be sure you heard me clearly. I am telling you that I am dealing with general counsels who will not let me assure the public that their product is safe. Number two, uh, I think there is an inability to realize that companies under siege are not in control of the FDA. That when you come under attack, the FDA is in control and that you can't say certain things. You can't say certain things for legal reasons and you can't say certain things because you may get the FDA's nose out of joint. You will then be declared to not be, you're not being transparent, you're not being forthcoming, when the reality is you often can't be. What I'd like my panelists to address is that really gnarly, ugly situation where companies under siege are unable to do the kinds of things that theoretically would be soothing to the general public. I'll, I'll jump right in there. Um, I think, I think I, I largely agree with what you said. Uh, although I do think a lot of companies hide behind the the veil of the FDA doesn't doesn't allow us to say this. 
Uh, although, you know, it's, it's, and it's convenient. Uh, unfortunately, safety in the realm of pharmaceuticals is a relative concept. Oh my God, why would the FDA approve a drug if it wasn't safe? That should never happen. That's what uh, Charles Grassley said after Vioxx. The FDA should not approve any new drugs that have risks. You know, it's hard to explain to people that all drugs have risks and benefits. All drugs are dangerous. Uh, Alan is the only person sitting on this panel who is constrained through regulated speech, although that is changing. That's another inter interesting panel. Uh, but you have to mitigate what you want to say, what would be useful and potent in a media cycle, I think to Eric's point, versus you know the, uh, the jam that can get you into uh, with FDA, uh, with uh, legal entities accusing you of uh, you know, off-label off speech. But again, it, it comes down to the fact that you know, we're dealing with scientific issues here, and the last time most people touched science uh, was in uh, high school, where there was a right answer and a wrong answer, and this is extremely uh, complicated, non-binary types of conversations, and that's why, you know, when I, I mean, to get an answer in 45 minutes other than I'll call you back is pretty astounding, because it is regulated speech, and that's this problem, people say, why isn't pharma more aggressive in social media? And part of the answer is the speed with which you have to deal with social media is simply not congruent with the way that regulated speech is used to um, getting things approved. Thank you. And if everybody could keep their answers somewhat clipped, because I want to be sure we're moving, we're moving on. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to be uh, befitting another lawyer on, um, on the panel here, contrarian. And um, my brother, who's a writer, says that um, uh, reporters are condemned by the narrative tradition. Um, they have to have a conflict and a resolution. Um, and to be contrarian, I think you can tell a consistent narrative that is an alternative narrative. It may not be my product is safe, but it is a narrative. And you know, if you can put together, which I try to do, the regulatory team you know, the marketing people, the product liability lawyers, and, and the scientists in the company, and you can create an alternative narrative and stick to it, um, then I think uh, you can say things. The, the key is, to a certain extent, your narrative has to be truthful and not misleading. Um, and occasionally FDA will, will complain to me that, oh, you went out with a you know, public statement that we didn't approve. Um, but it's a narrative. It's a story that you're telling. It's got to be really simple. But interestingly enough, it has to be simple to FDA as well. Even though there are all these scientists, lawyers, everybody you're dealing with, they respond to a simple narrative as well. And I'll quit there because I got some great stories about a good narrative. <coughs> Good narrative would be a great story. Um, uh, so I think that I, I don't think it's a bad thing not to be able to say that something is safe. Um, and I think I would just say that look, you know, if a if a company rises on relative risk, it will fall on relative risk. And until we can educate everyone, the difference between a relative risk reduction and an absolute reduction in risk, until we can really tell the truth, because words count. I mean, that's really, if you want to, I, mean, I, I have to go back to, to transparency and the truth. If you stick to a true and supportable narrative, you rarely really get in trouble. But people who go out there and, and push in, um, in many ways, maybe in advertising, but maybe more insidiously in, in other products that are, that are pushed to, to, to the prescriber, saying things like, this is a 40% reduction in risk of stroke. Really? Really, really, really? That is pretty damn hard to get. I don't care how many patients you have in your, in, in your, in your study. That is, that is really difficult to get. So, so I think that that's really important to understand. You know, if you decide that you're going to live by a relative risk narrative, you're gonna, your chances of failing and falling by that narrative are, are really great, relatively. Thank you. <laughs> Alan? So, so I, I mean, I agree with Peggy that we have to do a better job of educating. And, and I, I would actually be, um, Eric, you and I haven't talked about this. I, I would be in favor. In fact, 
I often say, if we don't believe our products are safe, we need to pull them from the market. Now, once we say our product is safe, I think to what Peggy's saying, we need to explain what that means, not just leave it there. I just, if I could, and I'm trying to keep this clip, the story Eric raises is, is one of my, I think it's really important to understand. When Johnson & Johnson pulled Tylenol from the market, which for which they have been lionized. I mean, that, that, as Eric can speak to, the case study that's always been taught, there was arsenic in their pills. This is not a tough decision. We learned there's arsenic in our pills. We pull it from the market. But that's not often what we confront. What we're confronting is a study that comes out, often an ambiguous study. What does it mean? Is it telling us that now the risks are greater than the benefits of the product? And often we have to make decisions because the media is calling, because all kinds of things are occurring. What are we to do? It's a much more nuanced scientific analysis than there's arsenic in our product. We have to do better at explaining ourselves as to how this all works. But I, I do think that contrast is one that's important to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, to, to Alan's point, um, when, it, when seven people die because cyanide is unequivocally in your pocket, it's not like, uh, in your product, it's not like people are saying, yeah, people getting killed by our product, should we keep it out there? Should, should, should we, I, I, I don't know what to do. I'm very confused about this. Uh, I, I, I think it's rather, it's rather straightforward what you have to do. Um, I think that you know one of the things, I've heard people in my industry say, if there's a problem with the product, you, you instantly recall it. My, my clients would be doing nothing all day long but recalling products. You mean to tell me that every time a dented Cheerios box turns up, you're supposed to be recalling products? It's a judgment call. Uh, I think for what it's worth, I mean, you know, the Tylenol legend was predicated on two myths. One myth was the instant recall. The product was not recalled instantly. It took eight days. Doesn't mean that it's because they didn't know. They didn't know that there was cyanide in the product. But though, if you watch the movie The Insider with Russell Crowe, he says, I don't hate all industries. I look at what Tylenol did. They immediately recalled. Can you imagine in today's uh, climate, waiting eight days to recall the product, you would be out of business, the CEO would resign. Um, the, the second myth was, to the point of transparency, is that the company immediate, uh, they immediately were transparent with the public and said that there was no cyanide in any of their plants. There was cyanide in their plants, even though that's not what caused it. They weren't transparent, and they weren't transparent because of evil, they weren't transparent because they faced what I face every day. You just don't know the facts. And what we hear from the media all the time is respond immediately. Immediately, we don't know anything immediately. So that, that is one of the challenges that, that we face in that world. Um, my, my third, and I think this will probably be the final question, and Gordon, I didn't know whether you wanted me to open up to, to the floor, but one of the things that has always fascinated me is the issue of when does an industry or a company become a villain? In my theory, when I, my career began in the early 1980s, <clears throat> the pharmaceutical industry was not a villain industry. Um, and I, I mark in my own mind the beginning of villainy to the movie The Fugitive with Harrison Ford, 1983, where the, the villain turned out to be not just the one-armed man, but the one-armed man working for the Devlin McGregor pharmaceutical company, not a real company. And so, you know, my question to the panel are how and when did, did the, he the pharma and health, I want to broaden that to the health industry, become a villain industry and why? I, I have a theory that I'll leave you to at the end, but not only when and why did it become a villain industry, but must it necessarily remain there? Is that simply the cost of doing business or is there something that the industry can do about it? Another, another great panel question, I mean, it helped me a whole other panel, but I think that you know, what began at least currently to let the yolk out of the egg a little bit was Vioxx, where people began to say, wow, you know, this company markets this drug, it's, it's, it's not safe, and somehow the FDA is, is complicit, 
and uh, we've really got to start thinking about that. Um, and it turns out, of course, that would turn that one around. And I think the larger question that Eric raised is, is when, when people said to Mark, so what are you guys going to do about this? And they said, we're going to litigate every case because we are on strong legal and ethical footing. And they did, and they won, and their stock prices went up, and their drugs are selling, and their pipeline is robust. I think part of the way you turn these problems around is not to kind of ro roll over and, uh, you know, please, sir, may I have another. A lot of it becomes standing up for what's right, and I think explaining what safety means, and explaining the value of innovation, and explaining the value a failure and explain that drugs don't come, generally speaking, from NIH science. It goes a long way, and it is an uphill battle, and it's one that's worth fighting. Yeah, let me just, before I go to you, to, to your Vioxx point, it's an interesting one, because PR 101 says, you, you know, you're accused of something, you admit to it, and the problem goes away. I see no evidence that that's true. What was interesting about the Vioxx case is Wall Street was saying that Merck was going to take a 25 to $50 billion hit on this. And Merck said, no, we're actually going to fight it. And they, they won most of their cases, and the settlement amount was $5 billion. And you know, do the math, $5 billion is a lot less than $25 or to $50 billion. And so that's when PR goes right out the window, and fighting something was actually, at least on a financial level, um, a wiser thing to do. You're we're going to go down. I, I, I just have to jump in here really quickly, um, because uh, Vioxx is like one of my favorite cases. Uh -huh. um, because I just want to tell you, as a person who covered um, Vioxx, and I covered it for, that was before we founded MedPage Today, and at the time I had my own business, and I was a, a, a freelance journalist, and I covered the Vioxx story for um, both Reuters and for WebMD. And I, 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 a lot of people knew that I was a medical journalist and that I wrote for healthcare professionals. And the, the day before, the evening before the press conference that happened before the market opened that day in September, I received a, not only an email but a telephone call telling me that there will be action tomorrow from, from Merck and that you will have information. I wasn't, I wasn't present on the, the, um, in, at, in the room for the announcement, but I had my line and my code to get into that. And I had my full packet with all the information before the press conference. I had it, I had written the leads, the tops, the headlines on my stories prior to the to saying, okay, the phone line is open now and we're listening to what they're saying. And and that was a great example is that if you come, if you prepare journalists, I mean really, you know, I that they they can they got they got away, the story was told in a way where they were not slammed from the beginning. Um, and of course to me the opposite was what, what happened with, uh, with GSK and Avandia. And um, when the story broke, you know, GSK went after a lot of people, I was one of them, and a number of physicians, well-known physicians. And then there was a congressional hearing. Um, and as it turned out, after all was said and done and the, and the FDA finished with it, that signal, that cardiovascular signal, was really not there, but that drug was dead already. Because believe you me, GSK made a lot of enemies with the way they handled it. Um, and they were, I've never seen a company as aggressive as they were on that. Anyway, just no, wanted to that, point that, that out. No, that's, a, that's an interesting. I, I was not aware that, oh, that that was the part of the package, but that, that makes sense. So, um, so that played out in yeah. the story. I think I need to quote Everett Dirksen, you know, a billion here, a billion there, and soon you're talking real mm -hmm. But <laughs> um, I guess uh, I'm getting back to my, my narrative, um, and that is that usually when one of these crises hits, you, you don't necessarily know all the facts. Um, but you can make an narrative, and I think that's the story that you're telling about Vioxx. And the narrative can be as simple as, you know, thank you for letting us know, you know, our company has these processes in place to deal with these issues. And let me lay out for you what those processes are and what we're gonna do. And that's a 45-minute, uh, that's not even a 45-minute story. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with whether your company is prepared to say things like that. Um, and, you know, in my industry anyway, there's, there's these consolidating large companies, and then there's always a lot of new startup companies. Um, and I think the new startup companies frequently haven't don't have that lesson 
you know, that we need to have narrative before the science is in place, because the science isn't going to be in place when that, when the uh, press's narrative hits the, hits the waves. So you have to have your own narrative. It has to be, you know, truthful, not misleading. It has to persuade. Uh, it has to be simple on all accounts. It's got to be simple to FDA, even though they're scientists, because they're going to be new to the specific issue, whatever it is. Got to be a simple story, you know, the same narrative, the protagonist, the antagonist, and what you anticipate the resolution to be. Only this time, you're playing the protagonist. Alan? Yes, yeah, so I just want to get back to your, your question, Eric, and then I'll, I'll come back to, to Vioxx for a second. Um, look, I, I, uh, I remember when I came into the industry, I came from defending these cases. Very often the way the dynamic works in these cases is you're in very hostile places. Every adverse point that can be made is made, whether something actually occurred, whether it's an uh, isolated email that was written, whatever. But as a result of that, I mean, I got to see a lot of the conduct that is not the kind of conduct we should engage in when we're in a caring business for patients. We are not selling refrigerators. We are not selling shoes. And I'm not trying to malign those consumer products. This is medicine, and it's about earning trust. And I think that we can talk a lot about communications. It's not only how you communicate, it's how you practice. And I do think that there were some practices back in the 90s. I have to go before Vioxx back in the 90s and the way sales representatives may have interacted before the code of interactions came out from pharma, that were not the kinds of things we should have been engaging in, being in the kind of business and in the earning trust. That is not what we should have been doing. And I do think that when, I think for many years before direct-to-consumer advertising, nobody knew who pharma companies were. It was. You, you bought your medicines and you didn't know it was Listerine or it was uh, Tylenol or was it, you know, J&J or uh, Warner Lambert or whomever. Um, I think then when that visibility started um, and combined with some of those practices, I do think that became a, a turning point. There's been a lot of reform in the industry. And I'm not saying people don't still make mistakes. And we have to do better, has been pointed out on the panel. But I do think there is more self-policing and more recognition of what we have to do in that regard. And I just want to say, just to show the difficulty here, and put aside litigation strategy, because, and I've been involved in many mass torts and running them and so forth, and we can do battle, we can not, it's very individualized um, what you do. But just to give an example, Merck decided to pull Vioxx from the market overnight. Now here's the difficulty. So what, what was the nature of the signal they saw? Because science evolves over time. Did it merit pulling the product from the market? There were a lot of patients who were using that medicine who were very upset. And one of the most challenging things about our industry is risks and benefits. It's the relative nature of it all. So you try to do something over here to warn more or pull a product, you're hurting people over here who rely upon that. It's that balance. Merck subsequently tried to get the product back on the market because as time evolved and as they evaluated that risk benefit, they thought that it was actually made sense to get the product made available again. They weren't allowed to do so. So I'm, I'm not questioning Merck. I'm not trying to draw any judgments around. It just shows, I think, the nature of the difficulty of what we engage in, which doesn't excuse bad practices. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because I, I, am, I have always been a skeptic of this idea that you're going to do a soft-focused ad campaign with little girls running through the field with daisies, and this is going to make people like your industry better. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I, I just think that, uh, to, to some of your points, that given the choice between that and making products that people want, I think one, 
I think doing that is going to get you more than, I, I just don't think you're gonna PR your way out of this. Um, I think that's a whole different thing. Gordon, did you want me, I just wanna make sure I'm respecting time. Uh, for qu uh, questions for, from the audience, do you wanna moderate that or, or I, I can or? Yeah, I, I have the okay. microphone, so please wait for me to come around. Any questions for the esteemed panel? <laughs> yes. Uh, very impressive. My focus is executive and leadership organizational change. What practices have you seen senior management and companies dealing with these crises that you would say are best practices, and what are the ones to really avoid? Well, I, I mean, I'm not, I, I think, I mean, we, we, we can go, go down the list here. I mean, as a general rule, the feeling at most companies, although no one will admit this, is whoever goes on TV loses their job. Um, and one of the first things that I see when one of these things happen is I might be saying, you know, as strongly as I feel, I th I'd like Peter to go on TV. He's so much better at this than I am. And Peter's going, you know, I understand, but maybe Peggy is better. Um, I, I think that you would be amazed by, I mean, the way that, that Hollywood portrays big companies as is as these hyper-competent, -com evil geniuses where people go in a room and say, and are in control of nature. Um, what I find is the most powerful companies in the world are terrified of returning Peggy's call. And, you know, I mean, to me, I am amazed at all these supposedly tough, ruthless, cutthroat people in the area of being able to engage in controversies. They're simply not able to do it. Uh, I don't think that there, are, there is a playbook. If there were a playbook, everybody would be using it. And all of my clients, I mean, the, you know, whenever there's a crisis hits, experts go on TV and say, well, this is what the company should have done. If that were really true, why would the biggest, richest, most powerful, smartest people in the world consistently botch their crises? But I, I, I have um, try, been trying to, with, with, with spotty success, try to get companies be uh, ready to engage in combat, not unlike a politician is prepared to do, but I don't think I'm getting too far in that, but I'd like to get further. I mean, obviously, truthful, accurate, not misleading, you know, with, with, with due speed stipulated. I think what companies need to learn, especially in the pharmaceutical space or healthcare space more broadly, is to be able to call bullshit when you see it, you know, rather than kind of letting it lie there, you know, call, call it out, and maybe the press reports it, and maybe, and maybe they don't. But if you don't call bullshit when it happens, don't expect other people to do it for you. I, I think the specific answer to your question is preparation. I think it's going to happen in, ev in every one of these industries. And uh, the team that you need to put together, litigators, scientists, and so forth, frankly, every one of them, I'm sad to say, is a prima donna. Um, they don't necessarily like working with each other they want to prove that one of them is better than the other and not get on TV themselves. Um, and I actually think it's possible to be prepared, but, you know, and have crisis management teams and do mock scenarios. And, yeah, you can always create a narrative. You can always be the good guy. I mean, it's, it, you just need to have, who are we going to put together? Can they work with each other? A lot of people can't work with each other, especially prima donna. Um, I probably, I don't really know the answer to this question, but I can give you a couple of observations that I'm always, um, I, I'm always uh, um, somewhat put off when um, I, when I'm greeted by um, by a group of leaders of any sorts of organization, and every one of those leaders, be it man or woman that I that I speak to, thinks that they that they are the smartest guy in the room. Um, those people scare me. Okay, so that's I don't think they're the best people to have out and out leading the charge. Um, but the other thing I would say is that, um, and I train my reporters this way, that if you ask a question of someone and their first response is that's that's a good question. Don't believe anything they say after that, I will say that. Uh, because, and if I train people for media, I would train them to not say, that's a good question. Um, because um, honestly, um, I, I just think, that's, that's to me, that's a red flag. So when you're asked a question, uh, you can pause. You don't have to answer immediately. But filling the space with, that's a good question, probably triggers a lot of people in the audience to think, oh, here we go. So, all right. 
How about we've been thinking about that question ourselves? <laughs> I think, I honestly, I, I will say that the best thing to me is just, hmm, okay, and then answer, answer the question because that, and that may be a great act, but to me, the signal to me then is they're, they've listened to my question and they are really thinking about an answer to the, to, the, to the question. And then if I have an additional question, I will follow up. Okay? Thank you. Alan? I don't, I don't have a whole lot to add other than I think it's critical to engage. I, I, you know, I don't know to someone's point, I think it was Eric, I you know there's a recipe for what you should do, but it seems we sort of see what you should not do. And going into a hole is not a good idea. Um, one thing I would, my final point that I would add, and this is really politically incorrect, but let's do it. Um, some people are just not good at this. And I think you can make people who are all right at it better, but there are some people who are complete dumpster fires when it comes to engaging in this type of combat. And, you know, it, it, it's, it sounds against everything we're taught to believe, but there are times that you should say, you know, this isn't your thing, and you shouldn't be the one out there doing that. By the way, let me just say that that was a horrible question. I just want to impress Peggy, so <laughs> I, I'm doing the opposite of what she, what she suggested. I just want to pick up on that as well. Is I, if I had a dollar for every time a reporter says to me, well, don't you think that, and you know, you have to, you have to remember to say, no, actually, that's not what I think. This is what I think. And you know, I don't think it's it's malice by a reporter. It's just you know where the reporter is going. But it, to Eric's point, you know, there are, you simply need to know what you're doing. Well, it, 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 there, you, it also get, gets to the point where every client I've ever had says things like, "We have to tell our side of the story." And I, you know, I hearken back to this isn't a pharma example, but it's in the public domain, so I can acknowledge it. I did some work. Uh, whenever there's a sports-related crisis, the shot callers are the corporate sponsors. It's not the athlete. And when Tiger Woods got in trouble. The, the pundit class was saying, Tiger needs to tell his side of the story. Do you know what his side of the story was? The 17 women you've heard about? <laughs> That's nothing. <laughs> We're talking about 904. And so, you know, before we, we, we start embracing the cliche that we have to tell our side of the story, what if you don't have one? What if it's awful? And so you really have to, not every side of the story is good. So, you know, I, I do think it has to be anchored somewhat in, in, in reality or else what you end up getting is no comment, which may say, which sometimes is the best of your horrible options. Or wise. Or, or which is the worst of your horrible options, yes. Other uh, questions? Anybody? Oh, okay. Hi, thank you all very much for the discussion today. Um, I'm Lisa mccormick Lavery. I work for Bristol-Myers Squibb in Corporate Communications. So one of the things that we are always looking to do is, is tell our good story, talk, talk about value, talk about innovation and things like that. And I know we're talking about crisis today, but in the absence of a crisis, would, um, how do we tell that, you know, try and help our reputation because it's, we're starting at a negative. We'd like people to understand we're always talking about pricing, but our side of the story is value, our side of the story is innovation, and our side of the story is every single patient who's being helped but it's very hard to get that out there and to talk about it in a thoughtful, reasoned way with the limited attention span we have and, and people's hunger for the bad news. So, well, the I mean, it, I mean, it depends what it is that you're talking about. If you're talking about Sovaldi, I think that's one methodology. If you're talking about PCSK9s, you know, it, it's something else. If you're talking just more broadly about the value of innovation, and which I think is the best place to go, and you know, the value is at that price. You know, value is the denominator. Price is the numerator among many, among many others. That's good too. But I don't, I don't think there. It, it, if you're talking about a company's R and D budget, that's great. If you're talking about a product, I think it's extraordinarily dependent on what that product is. If you're, if you're the umpteenth statin in a in a world of statins. You know, you know why, why are you relevant? There's got to be a relevant story there. You we're dealing in a world of personalized slash precision medicine. Do you have a companion diagnostic? You know, how are you getting into the right person at the right time and the right dose? You know, I, I think it becomes extremely uh, product specific. If you're speaking on a corporate perspective, what is the corporation doing relative to aiming its R and D uh, to value? I mean, I think it certainly can be done. It's tough because people are not predisposed to want to listen to you. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a story worth telling. 
Um, I, let's face it, I mean, the U.S. pharmaceutical industry has extended people's lives and, and improved, uh, you know, the care and comfort of uh, people who have illness. And, you know, the, the stories are endless in every field. Um, as Reagan would say, we have a capitalist system. That capitalist system creates investment um, based on the anticipation of profit. Um, other, the, the, the U.S. pharmaceutical industry makes drugs for the world. Um, we, in this country, have developed pretty much every pharmaceutical. If you're a French scientist, you want to develop a pharmaceutical, you come to the U.S. That's the way our system works. Um, it's, it's, it's the true story. Drugs don't come from the NIH, and another, not they don't do wonderful work because they do, but you know, doubling the NIH budget every 15 minutes you know, is not going to bring us any closer to solving the problem of Alzheimer's disease in this country, in my opinion. That those those solutions are going to come from people that are motivated to do it in in, in, in the practical application of pharmaceutical science. So um, that's an interesting point um, because uh, you know often we're um, uh, confronted with, well, the data when you look you look at a study that's it's published in Nijim, um, and um, and then you then you, you look into the support and you see that the study was um, supported um, and you know name the pharmaceutical company whatever, and then or maybe it says that it was supported by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and so there were many people that would look at that and would and would think, well, this must be this this is really great because this finding this is going to really mean something. Look at this, they had, here's a study supported by this government agency, our tax dollars, they have no bias um, that they, and, uh, and they're telling us to treat blood pressure more aggressively. And it's so important that before they even expose their data to peer review, they had a press conference in Washington. Oh my goodness, Congress was in session then. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness gracious, both the Senate and the House Finance Committees were going over the NIH budget, oh my Goodness. What a coincidence. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. You want to talk about bias? Do we have to understand bias? Probably the greatest bias that there is is in, in data that's reported by the NIH because they're always they're always looking for more money and where does the money come from? It comes from the Hill. So 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 you have to time. If you were to look at the timing of studies, you would find a remarkable, a remarkable connection. Um, between cycles, congressional cycles, and when findings come out on big NIH studies, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing necessarily, because on the on the the other way, NIH studies are huge. There's lots of numbers, and and what do we learn? You know, you learn more from big numbers, particularly if you're looking at something at like cardiovascular disease, not in your world of oncology, but certainly in the world of diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. Um, you know, we really you need a lot of a lot of numbers. So, but if, if you're talking about like how to how to tell the, how to get the good news out, I would say probably most of your good news is gonna come from those, those patient stories or maybe sometimes it's the provider and the, and the, and the patient together when they're telling, telling the stories. Um, and those are, that's all soft, we don't really do that, that sort of thing. Um, but there's lots of outlets, there's lots and lots of outlets that do do that sort of thing. Um, in my company, um, I'm page today, but I'm owned, our company is that we're owned by, we're part of Everyday Health, and we have a consumer division, and all of all of Everyday Health, all of the consumer division, is all patient stories, and it's a rich, it's a world of patient stories. There's lots of there's lots of good news there, um, so I guess that that's that that's probably the way that the way that gets out, um, and um, and I think that that's that's sort of useful. I think the wonderful thing, if I were in your shoes, and I've never been in your shoes, so you know, but if I were there, I would think that this is like the time to do this because. Um, there are so many outlets. There, every phone is an outlet for all kinds of information. And there's, there's hundreds, there's thousands and thousands of apps that are pushing out information. Um, so, you're, so there's no end um, to, to outlets. Um, the, only thing that, uh, the only thing where you have to would discriminate would be to, to make sure that they're all, that they're all reliable. And that, that's a little bit more tricky, I think. Actually, that's quite a bit more tricky. But um, but so that's that's what I would do. That's that's where that's that's your avenue. It seems to me. Let me just uh, try and bust the NIH myth as well. Um, before we instituted a capitalist system in 1963 for drug development, the NIH budget for clinical trials was tenfold that of the of the private industry, Wall Street finance. Today, it's the opposite. 
the, the private industry pays billions of dollars more for clinical development studies than the NIH does. It's over tenfold higher. The money used to do clinical trials in the United States comes from Wall Street and investors. It doesn't come from Congress. Look, I, know, I know if you guys follow Senator Senator Warren from Massachusetts a couple of months ago, maybe a year ago, she was talking about kind of the, the Bayh-Dole Act and the need for NIH to you know get its foot in the water about all the wonderful drugs it's actually developed and isn't recouping any profits from. And uh, when you look at these statements of various NIH directors, including the current one, and I think Elias Sirhuni was probably the most vocal about this, they will say honestly that the overwhelming, the overwhelming amount of drugs on the market, especially the breakthrough drugs, don't come from NIH work. You know, you need, so again, you need to point this, if you don't point out the truths people assume are right, except that they're not, you can't get that next step forward. I don't want, I want to also go back to what Alan said, it's really important about what's happening with Medicare Part B, and it's very technical. But all the stories, all the anecdotes you see in the paper about patients not being able to afford their medicines, well, those, are, those are important stories. But if this goes through, patients are also going to be denied their medicines under the cover of punishing the pharmaceutical industry. So if I could just make um, just three quick points. Um, first of all, I, I do think the industry does a very good job, and it needs to continue better and better job of reminding folks what's at stake. And um, there's individual companies are doing it, the trade organizations are doing it. And I've been in the industry long enough, I know every cycle, companies, communications companies say, oh, well, let's do it, there's a different way to do it, there's another way to do it, and so forth, and we try various variations on the theme. It's great, we should continue to do it. That's not gonna be the answer. Secondly, I think mystery is not our friend. And my fellow panelists here are talking about a lot of the myths that are out there. <clears throat> myths from us aren't good either. And I, I recommend you to, I just saw Eli Lilly put out a um, game board on their blog site or tweet site, I, I don't know where, where you, you just move pieces and explains like the clinical trial process and the, and, and the um, reimbursement process. And you know, we talk about pricing. I remember when I first came into the industry, you can't have a five, oh, what, how do you set your price? What's your price? I mean, there are certain proprietary and competitive issues, but even internally in the company, you can't have a five minute conversation. It's a long conversation. Our pricing system, there's so many different levers to it and people involved in it. So I think we have to find ways to sort of break things down and simplify them. And the third thing, which may be counter to where we began this whole discussion, I just say is, person who's in the industry. At some point, there's only so much we can do about this. We have to get into the work at hand. I mean, I want to go back to why people are drawn into this industry. It's not to have this fight. It's not to be defending our reputation all the time. It is actually to do the R&D that will generate the products, that will get marketed out there, that will do good and do well for everybody involved. And at some point, you kind of got to develop a little thick skin around it and keep going, which is doesn't deny any of the other points, but if we sat around worrying about this all the time, we wouldn't do anything, and that's part of the problem with what's going on. My final point uh, to your question would be don't be afraid to preach to the choir, because I notice a lot of corporate folks have a great desire to be loved by people who either hate them or who don't care about them. And it is simply not achievable to make that happen. Um, but I do think when you have audiences that have a pre-existing interest in what you're doing, don't neglect them. Um, because I, I don't, it, it's, it's this masochistic desire, I think, that how can we, oh my God, there's somebody out there who doesn't like us, how can we even go on? And it's, it's almost like that Seinfeld episode where George becomes obsessed with this woman who hates him even though he doesn't even like her. And so, I, you know, I, I think that there's just something to be said for letting go of things that are simply not achievable and focusing on things that are. So with that, I thank you all for coming. 
And, Eric, can uh, I just yeah, make oh, one yes. final point? Sure, Tom. Because I think it's a critical point. It goes back to the presentation. I see a very unhealthy link between the way the financial industry developed and the way the pharmaceutical industry is developing. Oh. If you go back 20 years, the financial industry talked about you know, engagement with the media and stakeholders about what they were doing. We had people who were boring bank managers. What then happened was the sort of drug of the uh, investment banking took over. And we worked for eight of the world's 20 largest banks. All they wanted to, they wanted to talk about was their financial results. Mm -hmm. Now, financial results go up and they go down. When you talk to a journalist about great financial results, they'll write a story. When your financial results start to go down, they'll write 50 stories. They'll kill you. If you look at the pharmaceutical industry at the moment, because of the wave of uh, mergers and acquisitions and so forth, it, it in the media, the, the, by far the dominant story is finance. And when an industry turns in on itself, and the vast majority of stories being told are about finance, completely to what Alan was saying, it loses its focus on the people, the patients, the, uh, and, and the cures and all that sort of stuff. And that is the, the single thing is, particularly for big pharma, because the Wall Street Journal will write all these stories, they have to write a story if a deal is above a certain level, is turn off the financial story tab and turn on the tabs and create the stories about patients, about the, you know, the good side of the industry, get the industrial the industry associations focusing on the fact that 99.7% of medicines are safe and 1.3 aren't. You know, turn off the financial tap. That's the biggest thing. Because that's what's dominating. And when it turns, it'll be a tidal wave that'll leave the industry looking very uncomfortable. Thanks, Tom. And thanks to everybody for coming out. Yeah, just a um, uh, couple of things. Yeah. So Eric, I wanted to thank you, actually, but thank <laughs> and, and the panelists for some really stimulating uh, discussion. Um, thank you very much for sharing your experiences and time with us. There's some very insightful um, comments. Um, today's event is actually being the first in a series of these events. So we're going to be hoping to hold one, uh, one every year so we can share um, thinking on this and move the industry, this vital industry forward. And I hope we can... Um, uh, welcome you again next year when hopefully the industry would have moved a little bit further down that path that you were just raising. Um, if you do want any more information on what's been said, we'll be publishing on this on the karma.com website and um, hopefully we can continue the engagement we've seen today. But very many thanks to everyone for coming today. We much appreciate your attendance. And again, thank you to the panel. At least I did that when I okay. stood up at the end. We've got a drug that can solve that. Right? Okay. Anyway. Um,